Where are Elmer, Herman, Bert, Tom, and Charlie? The weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter, all, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed in a fever, one was burned in a mine, one was killed in a brawl, one died in a jail, one fell from a bridge toiling for children and wife. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie, and Edith, the tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one? All, all are sleeping on the hill. One died in shameful childbirth, one of a thwarted love, one at the hands of a brute in a brothel, one of broken pride in search for heart's desire, one after life in faraway London and Paris was brought to her little space by Ella, Kate, and Mag. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Uncle Isaac and Aunt Emily, and old towny Kincaid, and Sven Houston, and Major Walker, who had talked with venerable men of the Revolution? All, all are sleeping on the hill. They brought them dead sons from the war, and daughters whom life had crushed, and their children fatherless, crying all all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where is old Fiddler Jones who played with life all his ninety years, braving the sleet with bared breast, drinking, rioting, thinking neither of wife nor kin, nor gold, nor love, nor heaven? Lo, he babbles of the fish fries of long ago, of the horse races, of long ago on Clary's Grove, of what Abe Lincoln said one time at Springfield. When I first came to Spoon River, I did not know whether what they told me was true or false. They would bring me the epitaph and stand around the shop while I worked and say, he was so kind. He was wonderful. She was the sweetest woman. He was a consistent Christian. And I chiseled for them whatever they wanted all in ignorance of its truth. But later, as I lived among the people here, I knew how near to the life were the epitaphs that were ordered for them as they died. But still I chiseled whatever they paid me to chisel and made myself party to the false chronicles of the stones even as the historian does, who writes without knowing the truth, or because he is influenced to hide it. I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy, happy and strong. <laughs> the first place I worked was at 
Thomas Green's On a summer's day When she was away He stole into the kitchen And took me right in his arms And kissed me on my throat I turning my head And then neither of us seemed to know what happened. And I cried for what would become of me. And cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day, Mrs. Green said she understood and would make no trouble for me. And being childless, would adopt it. He had given her a farm to be still. So she hid in the house and sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her. And all went well. And the child was born. Oh, they were very kind to me. Later, I married Gus Bergman, and years passed. But At political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, that was not it. No, I wanted to say. That's my son. That's my son. I was the only child of Francis Harris of Virginia and Thomas Green of Kentucky, a valiant and honorable blood both. To them, I owe all that I became, judge, member of Congress, leader in the state. From my mother, I inherited vivacity, fancy, language. From my father, will, judgment, logic. All honor to them for what service I was to the people. I preached 4,000 sermons. I conducted 40 revivals and baptized many converts, yet no deed of mine shines brighter in the memory of the world, and none is treasured more by me. Look how I saved the blisses from divorce and kept their children free from that disgrace. To grow up into moral men and women, happy themselves, a credit to the village. Now, Reverend Wiley advised me not to divorce him for the sake of the children, and Judge Somers advised him the same, so we stuck to the end of the path. But two of the children thought he was right, and two of the children thought I was right, and the ones who sided with him blamed me, and the ones who sided with me blamed him. And they all grieved 
for the one they sided with, and all were torn with the guilt of judging and tortured in soul because they could not admire both him and me. Now every gardener will tell you that plants grown in cellars or under stones are twisted, yellow, weak, and no mother would let a baby suck diseased milk from her breast. Oh, but preachers and lawyers advise the raising of souls where there is no sunlight, only twilight, and there is no warmth only dampness and cold. <laughs> Preachers and lawyers. I was 16 and I had the most terrible dreams and specks before my eyes and nervous weakness and I couldn't remember the books I read, like Frank Drummer, who memorized page after page. And my back was weak, and I worried and worried, and I was embarrassed, and I, I stammered my lessons. And when I stood up to recite, I'd forget everything I had studied. Well, then I saw Dr. Weiss's advertisement and read everything in print, just as if he had known me, and about the dreams that I couldn't help. So I knew I was marked for an early grave. And I was worried until I got a call and then the dream stopped and then I slept the sleep without dream here on the hill by the river. If the learned Supreme Court of Illinois got at the secret of every case as well as it does in a case of rape, it would be the greatest court in the world. A jury, if neighborly mostly, with Butch Welby as foreman, found me guilty in 10 minutes and two ballots on a case like this. Richard Bannel and I had trouble with offense, and my wife and Mrs. Bannel quarreled as to whether Ipava was a finer town than Table Grove. I woke one morning, and the love of God brimming over in my heart, and I went to see Richard to settle offense, the spirit of Jesus Christ. I knocked on the door, and his wife opened. She smiled and asked me in. I entered. She slammed the door and began to scream, Take your hands off, you low-down varlet! Just then her husband entered, and I waved my hands, choked up with words, and he, and he got his gun, and I ran out. But neither the Supreme Court nor my wife believed a word she said. Don't you see this was the way of it? We bought the farm with what he inherited, and his brothers and sisters accused him of poisoning his father's mind against the rest of them. And we never had any peace with our treasure. The moraine took the cattle, and the crops failed, and lightning struck the granary. So we mortgaged the farm to keep going. And he grew silent and was worried all the time. And then some of the neighbors refused to speak to us, taking sides with his brothers and sisters, and I had no place to turn. As one may say to himself at an earlier time in life, no matter, so-and-so is my friend, or I could shake this off with a little trip to Decatur. And then the dreadfulest of smells infested the rooms. So I set fire to the beds. And the old witch house went up in a roar of a flame while I danced in the yard with waving arms while he wept like a freezing steer. I inherited 40 acres from my father. And by working my wife, my two sons and two daughters from dawn to dusk, I acquired a thousand acres, but not content, wishing to own 2,000 acres. I bustled through the years with ax and plow, toiling, denying myself, my wife, my sons, and my daughters. Now, Squire Higby wrongs me to say that I died from smoking Red Eagle cigars eating hot pie and gulping coffee 
during the scorching hours of harvest time brought me here ere I had reached my 60th year. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap out at Winchester. One time, we changed partners driving home in the moonlight of middle June. And then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for 75 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I reached the age of 60. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, oh. and for a holiday, oh, rambled over the fields where sang the larks, and by Spoon River, gathering many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weed, oh, shouting to the wooded hills and singing to the green valleys. At 96, I had lived enough. Well, that is all. And passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness? Anger, discontent and, 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 and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes Life to love life. I have long studied the marble that was etched for me. A boat with unfurled sail at rest in a harbor. In truth, it represents not my destination, but my life. For love was offered me, but I shrank from its disillusionment. Sorrow came to my door. Afraid. Ambition called to me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while, I hungered for meaning in my life. And now I know that we must lift the sails and catch the winds of destiny wherever they drive the boat. To find meaning in one's life may end in madness, but life without meaning is the torture of restlessness and vague desire. It is a boat longing for the sea 
God is afraid. Mr. Kessley, you know, was in the army, and he drew six dollars a month as a pension. And he stood on the corner talking politics, or sat at home reading Grant's memoirs. I supported the family by washing, learning the secrets of all the people from their counterpanes and curtains, shirts and skirts. But things that are new grow old at length, and they're replaced with better, or none at all. People are prospering, or falling back. I... Rents and patches widen with time, and no thread or needle can pace decay. And there are some stains that baffle soap, and... Colors that run in spite of you, blame though you are for spoiling a dress. Handkerchiefs and napery have their secrets. The laundress life knows all about it. And I, who went to all the funerals held in Spoon River, swear I never saw a dead man's face without thinking, it looks like something washed and ironed. I said, when they handed my diploma, I said, I will be good and wise and brave and help with the others. I said, I will carry the Christian creed in the practice of medicine. Somehow, the world and other doctors know what's in your heart. The moment you make this high soul resolution, and the way of it is, it starve you out. And no one comes to you poor. find out too late that being a doctor is just a way of making a living. And when you are poor and carry the, carry the weight of the Christian creed and wife and children all on your back, it is too much. That's why I, I made the Elixir of Youth, which landed me in jail at Peoria, branded a swindler and a crook and the upright federal judge. away and was gone for a year and when he came home he told me this silly story about being kidnapped by pirates on Lake Michigan and being kept chained so he could not write to me. I pretended to believe him although I knew very well what he was doing. I knew he met the milliner Mrs. Williams now and then when she would go to the city to buy goods as she said but a promise is a promise. And a marriage is a marriage. And out of respect for my own character, I refuse to be drawn into a divorce by a scheme of a husband who has merely grown tired of his marital vow and duty. No, they laughed at me as Professor Moon, as a child in Spoon River, Born with a thirst for knowing about the stars, they cheered when I spoke of the lunar mountains and the thrilling heat and cold and the uh, ebon valleys by the silver peaks and Spica a quadrillion miles away and the little is a man. But now that my grave is honored, friends, let it not be because I uh, taught the lore of the stars at Knox College, but rather for this, that through the stars I preached the greatness of man, who nonetheless was a part of the scheme of things for the distance of Spica or the spiral nebulae, nor any the less a part of the question of what the drama means.
Maurice, weep not. I am not here under this pine tree. The balmy air of spring whispers through the sweet grass. The stars sparkle. The whippoorwill calls. But thou grievest, while my soul lies rapturous in the blessed nirvana of eternal light. Go to the good heart that is my husband who broods about what he calls our guilty love. Tell him that my love for you, no less than my love for him, brought out my destiny. That through the flesh, I won spirit, and through spirit, peace. There is no marriage in heaven, but there is love. Whoever thou art that passes by, know that my father was gentle and my mother was violent. While I was born the whole of such hostile halves, not intermixed and fused, but each distinct, feebly soldered together. Some of you saw me as gentle, some as violent, some as both. But neither half of me wrought my ruin. It was the falling asunder of halves, never a part of each other, that left me a lifeless soul. Out of me, unworthy and unknown, the vibrations of deathless music. With malice toward none, with charity for all. Out of me, the forgiveness of millions toward millions, and the beneficent face of a nation shining with justice and truth. I am Anne Rutledge, who sleep beneath these weeds, beloved in life of Abraham Lincoln, wedded to him, not through union, but through separation. Bloom forever, O oh Republic, from the dust of my bosom. I was not beloved of the villagers, but all because I spoke my mind and met those who transgressed against me with plain remonstrance, hiding, nor nurturing, nor secret griefs, nor grudges. That act of the Spartan boy is greatly praised, <laughs> who hid the wolf under his cloak, letting it devour him uncomplainingly, it is braver, I think, to snatch the wolf forth and fight him openly, even in the street amid dust and howls of pain. The tongue may be an unruly member, but silence poisons the soul. Berate me who will. I am content. How many times in the 20 years that I was your leader, friends of Spoon River, did you neglect the convention or caucus and leave on my hands the burden of guarding and saving the people's cause. Some of you were ill, or your grandmother was ill, or you drank too much and fell asleep, or you said, he is our leader, all will be well, he fights for us, we need do nothing but follow. 
But oh, how you cursed me when I fell. How you cursed and said I betrayed you for leaving the caucus room for a moment when the people's enemy assembled therein waited for their chance to destroy the sacred rights of the people. You common rabble. I left the caucus to go to the urinal. Out of the dust, out of the slime, a little rust and a little lime. Muscle and gristle, mucin, stone, braid with a pestle, fat and bone. Out of the marshes, out of the vaults, matter crushes gas and salts. What is this you call a mind? Flitting, drifting, pale and blind. Soul of the swamp that rides the wind. Jack-o'-lantern, here you are. Dream of heaven, pine for a star. Chase your brothers to and fro. Back to the swamp, at last you'll go.